Welcome to our podcast, The Better You Are, The Better You Are. Whether it is physically, mentally, or spiritually, when you know better, you can do better. And when you do better, you'll be better. On this podcast, we share knowledge, expertise, opinions, and experiences. All things that can help you to change the game. By the time we're done, it's hard for you not to be encouraged. So join us. We have a very talented team of experts with us today that are highly competent, very caring, and genuinely committed to sharing their knowledge and expertise regarding cardiovascular disease and some of the things people need to know to help them reduce their risk of developing heart disease. Our experts today include Dr. Tamika Dawson, a highly experienced family and sports medicine physician based in Indianapolis, Indiana. She has over 20 years of experience and is a course director at the Indiana University School of Medicine. Dr. Lyndon Dungy is the founder and CEO of Emanuel Dental in Farmington, Minnesota. He completed advanced training in dentistry after dental school and has been involved in numerous clinical activities, including serving as an instructor at the University of Minnesota School of Dentistry. Dr. Dungy has also been the Director of Dental Health Services and a working practitioner in community clinics in the Metropolitan Twin Cities before beginning his own practice at Emanuel Dental. Dr. Corin Love Davis is an obstetrician gynecologist with the Ascension Medical Group in Indianapolis, Indiana. She specializes in treating female reproductive health conditions with a mission to provide education and compassionate, excellent care for all women. Dr. Mario Piles also works for the Ascension Medical Group in Indianapolis and Noblesville, Indiana. He is the Medical Director of Cardiology, as well as the Director of the Cardiac Catheterization and Vascular Laboratory at the Riverview Health Heart and Vascular Center in Indiana. And I am Dr. Lauren Dungy poitras I am a Maternal Fetal Medicine Specialist with the Indiana University School of Medicine and I have decades of experience and have worked with multiple clinical and non-clinical programs throughout my career, including here in Indiana, as well as in other states. Today, we're gonna talk about cardiovascular disease, which is the leading cause of death in the United States, and it's a leading cause of maternal mortality, meaning the death of a woman within one year of pregnancy. And we've brought together a fine group of experts today who are fully qualified to um, be involved in our discussion. And the beauty of this panel is that what we talk about today can impact pregnant women, non-pregnant women, women, children, men, everybody. So it's a great way to educate people and we're excited to do it. So I wanna start out with what is cardiovascular disease? And I would like to ask Dr. Piles to tell us, what is cardiovascular disease? Thank you. Cardiovascular disease, as you said, affects millions of people in the world. Mm -hmm. It is the number one cause of death in the United States as well now considered the number one cause of death worldwide. I like to define cardiovascular disease as a kind of a compilation of disease of the heart as well as the vessels. Mm -hmm. So when I look at cardiovascular disease, I look at it from an anatomical situation where the heart itself is kind of the, the, the center point if it causes disease, you don't get good blood flow outside the, outside the heart to the rest of the body. And then if you get disease of those vessels that feed the, uh, the uh, organs, then you also have problems. So let's take a look at the heart. The heart itself has a disease problem that could be heart disease from artery disease. That is, you develop plaque in the vessels, and that plaque can actually reduce the blood flow to the, to the heart, and it can cause a heart attack. So we have high cholesterol that builds up certain parts of the, of the plaque. And, and again, you get inflammation in that artery. And that artery then can have a ruptured plaque and go downstream and reduce the blood flow. So that can cause a heart attack. So also we have heart disease from valve problems. Right. We also think about valvular heart disease. Now, you have four valves in your heart. Sometimes these valves can develop uh, hardening and restriction to flow and not have enough blood flow out of the heart to, to, uh, to actually feed the vital organs. And the heart, those valves can also leak and be in, insufficient and dysfunctional. 
and that's called valvular heart disease. And as we talk about, um, I'm because, sure- And that's because the valves keep the blood going one direction, right. and when they leak, it's not going out the that's way right. we want it it's to go. It's the right? simple plumbing. So if you back up the, uh, the uh, blood flow, it can get into the lungs and cause problems. Mm -hmm. And infection is a big problem with the, with the um, valves, and we probably will talk about that when it comes to, to, to uh, dental hygiene. Mm -hmm. And if you take a look at the, the, the heart itself, if it starts depositing certain proteins that are abnormal into the heart, that's called a restrictive heart disease. Mm -hmm. It's a restriction where the heart itself is so stiff, it doesn't contract well and it doesn't relax well. And then you have uh, a condition of the heart where you have inflammation buildup. We saw this in COVID, where we have myocarditis. Myo means heart carditis, it's inflammation of the heart. And that can make the heart very weak and baggy and not have enough uh, uh, contraction to fill blood flow out to the vital organs. Mm -hmm. Now let's take a look at outside of the heart, the vessels. You have these vessels called carotid arteries up in here, right? Now these arteries also can develop plaque buildup and also release the plaque into the brain and cause a stroke. That's a significant cardiovascular entity that can cause high mortality. And as well, if you have a large stroke, you can bleed into the area of your stroke, and then you can have what we call a hemorrhagic stroke, where you get blood into the brain that can damage the brain. And let's take a look at the arteries in the, in the, in the chest, called the aorta and the abdomen. It's the largest artery system uh, in, in the body. And it can build up plaque and disease and also start to dilate up. And you call that's called an aneurysm. And that aneurysm can actually rupture and also tear. And that's a significant problem that can cause um, uh, death. If you take a look lower down into the lower extremity, especially in diabetics, they can develop what we call peripheral vascular disease, where they have plaque buildup in their major arteries in their legs and decrease the blood flow to their feet and they can develop ulcers. And these ulcers can get infected and then get deposited in uh, bacteria into those ulcers and be released into the bloodstream. And that called a system called sepsis. And that is very, very detrimental to, to, to patients when they get bacteria in the blood that travels everywhere. So cardiovascular disease in itself is a dynamic disease that affects the entire body. Mm -hmm. So it behooves us to learn about it early so that we can prevent it. And, and, and as I said, I deal with um, obstetrics, as does Dr. Love Davis, and 80% um, of maternal deaths in the United States are related to mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease mm -hmm. that's not identified until after, the, unfortunately, the woman dies. So risk factors they look back and say, yeah, we think a lot of these women had risk factors where we should have recognized that they might be at risk for, for cardiovascular disease. What are some risk factors that we want to be attentive to or to look for or to make sure if you have this risk factor, you're more at risk for cardiovascular disease? Yeah, that's a great segue into this about cardiovascular disease. There's two types of risk factors. There's a modifiable risk factor, something you can do about, right? right. Okay, you can do something about that. And then there's non-modifiable modifiable risk factors, and that is family history. So if your mother, your father, your brother, sister, mm -hmm. biological mother, father, brother, sister has disease, probably most likely you have the, uh, the uh, a gene. Mm -hmm. And then you can affect the expression of that gene by influencing the modifiable risk factors, which include tobacco, right? Smoking, Smoking. or eating, or, or as we talked about, uh, even chewing. Not even just, chewing, yeah. that's bad. Mm -hmm high blood pressure, right. okay? Diabetes, sugar problems, mm -hmm. okay? Obesity, inactivity, bad eating, not eating the appropriate uh, foods. We always say, what? Food, food is medicine, medicine right? <laughs> so if you put the appropriate food in your body, it can get metabolized to great medicines, right? right. So those are the modifi modifiable risk factors that you can do yourself, exercising, 150 minutes a week. Mm -hmm. That's a great thing. That's tough. I get it sometimes, but most of the times I don't. But I try every week to try to get that 150 minutes of, of uh, aerobic uh, modifiable uh, risk factor, okay, right. for exercise. Those are the key things. Great. And, and Dr. Dawson, I know you deal with high blood pressure, hypertension. What is that? How is that diagnosed? And what do people need to know about that?
So 130 over 80, we want to start paying attention to it, doing what we can to modify our lifestyle to make that a little bit better. And then if it's greater than 140 over 90 persistently, you might consider treatment. Is that correct? Okay. okay. You know, I always tell my patients, blood pressure reading, you know, people always say, well, I'll have a headache if my blood pressure is high. That's why they say that blood pressure is a silent killer. You don't necessarily have any yeah. symptoms if your blood pressure is high. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have a stroke or severe heart disease. We have currently have a patient who has not come to the doctor for three years. She was borderline, mm -hmm. and now she has cardiomyopathy, which mm -hmm. caused her to have heart failure. Cardiomyopathy is, yes, indeed, yes. So heart failure. Essentially, yep. her heart got bigger because working harder to pump, and boom, now her heart right. And as you point out, and I think it's such an important thing to point out, you cannot feel like you have hypertension or high blood pressure. You have to have your blood pressure monitored. Mm -hmm. And in speaking of that, I know, Dr. Piles, that you're very particular about blood pressure monitoring. I know you do your own in your office to make sure it's done correctly. Yeah. Can you tell us how you, how you do your blood pressures in the office and what's important for somebody at home who's doing their own home blood pressure monitoring or or they go to the doctor to make sure it's done correctly? What, what do you recommend? Yeah, I like to have the blood pressure done at home. I mean, sometimes people, it's hard to them to afford a blood pressure cuff, so I try to get it for them from the pharmaceutical company because they will offer that sometimes. That's good to know. That's good to know, yeah. yeah. So I have them, I actually tell them to sit down, the back up against a chair, just relax, and then take the blood pressure. I have them take it about two or three times and make sure it's, it's consistent and they get the right reading. Then I ask them to bring their blood pressure cuff to the office. Right. Then I have them take the blood pressure cuff, put it on them, their home cuff, and then take the blood pressure, and then we take it and see if there's a difference. There's usually maybe about a 10, 15 millimeter difference. At least they know what blood pressure to expect in the office and then also the blood pressure at home. Mm -hmm. So it's consistent. So when we're titrating medicines, we know what it's gonna be at home right. and at the office. So that's a big thing. And also too, I have them take their medicine before they come to the office. Cause so often the blood pressure is high. I said, did you take your medicine this morning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, doc, I just took it. So we know <laughs> the half-life of some of these medicines takes yeah. a little bit of time for the blood pressure to get down. So often, Sometimes the doctor may prescribe too much medicine and then they go home and take the medicine and then they pass out, mm -hmm. especially with our uh, older population where their vessels are very, very stiff. And so they tend to have a higher blood pressure in the office and much lower blood pressure at home. So it's very important for our elderly to have their blood pressure taken at home because that's where it really counts and they may fall and break a hip, right. which is another issue. So. Taking the blood pressure is a technique that the patients need to understand and do. I do it myself. I sit down, both feet on the ground, put my blood pressure on, automatic. Okay, there it is. I take it three times. Okay, that's what I do. And then sometimes I even go in the office because I may even have white coat hypertension. What is white? I was going to ask you about that next. What is white hypertension? Because I know Dr. Love Davis and I certainly have people come into our offices the and their time. blood pressure's up, but it's only when I come to the doctor. Can yeah. you talk to us a little bit about yeah. white you know, coat hypertension? The, the, the stigma of white coat hypertension is that patients tell me, well, I have white coat hypertension. It doesn't matter. My, my blood pressure is high all the time. Well, if you take a look at some studies, mm -hmm. studies have shown over five years of people who were compared, who had high blood pressure, and then those people who just had white coat hypertension. At five years, some of those people had their first stroke because they had white coat hypertension. Mm. So white coat hypertension is not a benign situation, okay? I consider white coat hypertension if someone who already knew what their blood pressure was when they woke up that morning, they came to the office, they already took their blood pressure medicine, and then they had a blood pressure taken. And their blood pressure may be up 10, 20 millimeters of mercury, that's probably white coat hypertension. Mm -hmm. But a blood pressure of 200 over 110 is not white coat hypertension. Mm -hmm. I want people to know that because that is wrong, that's pathologic. Mm -hmm. So white coat hypertension, although it does exist, but it can be pathologic if, left, if met untreated over time. And the way to determine whether it's white coat hypertension is to take your blood pressure at home and bring your blood pressure cuff to the office and also have your blood pressure taken with your home cuff 
and the office cup so you can tell the difference. So to your point, you can't just come into a doctor's office once a year, have a blood pressure. It's a little bit elevated and say, oh, I just have white coat hypertension. That's you right. have to be taking it home to know what it is on a more regular basis mm -hmm. and know that it only goes up 10 to 20. About, 10, uh, about 20 to 30 at, at most. But if it's, it. if it's way up, it's not white coat hypertension. I, I would like to bring up too a, a condition called mask hypertension. Some people don't even think about that. So if they have a, a patient has a really good relationship with their with their physician and they trust their physician, their blood pressure may be well controlled in the office. But they go home, a stressful situation, their blood pressure is sky high. Mask hypertension. So the physician may think the blood pressure is under control because it's controlled in the office. But it goes home, the blood pressure is sky high because of all the stress. Or you go to things. work. Or you go to work. <laughs> yes. Where people aren't so, always. So that's a stress is a cause for heightened blood pressure. So we need to know what the blood pressure is at home and also the blood pressure in the office so we can find out what is mask hypertension and what is white coat hypertension. And why is hypertension a risk factor for cardiovascular disease? Yeah, I mean, we could go hours to talk about hypertension and why it's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It's the physiology of that. So when the blood pressure is high in the vessels, what happens? You start breaking down the most great, I call it the greatest uh, endocrine organ in your body. It's called the endothelium. Mm -hmm. That endothelium is the lining of the vessels in the arteries and veins. So what happens when you have all this pressure and force and shear forces in the vessels, it starts breaking down the components of the endothelium. So the heart has to pump so hard to push it out exactly. that it shears and it hits those it linings. It hits those linings. And those linings have great hormones that keep the vessel in a, what we call a homeostatic situation mm -hmm. where it's normal. So if you need additional blood, it dilates. So that hormone is released and it causes the artery to dilate. And if you don't need much, it starts to shrink. Mm -hmm. But hypertension takes away that hormone that causes the vessel to dilate. So you have these hormones that cause the vessel to constrict go unopposed. Right. So you start reducing the uh, blood flow to the vital organs, and that can cause kidney failure. You have people on dialysis. That's not good. You want to prevent that. You have strokes, and you have heart attacks. And you also develop this peripheral vascular disease process, which I alluded to in, uh, in the beginning. So yes, hypertension is very bad, but I did not talk about hypertension when it came to heart problems, mm -hmm. like the, like the uh, mechanism of how the heart gets very thick, just like you said. The heart has to pump just like you're mm -hmm. pumping iron. The heart has to pump against that high pressure in the aorta. It can get very, very thick and become inefficient and cannot fill and relax well in order to get the blood out appropriately. And then over time, if it's not treated, that heart can get very, very weak mm -hmm. and you lose that, that, that thickness and becomes boggy. Right. And now you have forward flow problems. So Treating hypertension early mitigates all these other problems. The better you are, <laughs> the better, better you are. are. So the better That's you right. are early on in any disease process or before um, um, we identify actual disease, and the earlier we treat it, the better we are. Thank you for listening in today. Weren't you inspired, encouraged, and uplifted? We hope so, because we're praying the best for you. Join us again next time for more Betterment. Because the better you are, the better you are.